This is Thursday, December 22nd, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Charles Levitt. Welcome, Charlie. Thank you. Okay. And may I ask when you were born? Where? Uh, when? Uh, May 30th, 1930. And where were you born? In Boston. And what town do you live in now? In Natick. Marital status? Widower. And do you have children? Hmm? Uh, do you have children? Four children. Four children. Any yeah. grandchildren? Seven grandchildren, one great grandchild. Good for you. And tell us, uh, you, uh, what part of Boston were you living in during your childhood? Roxbury. And what was Roxbury like when you were growing up? Well, the part that I was in was fine. Uh -huh. There were some uh, rough parts, but overall, uh, it was calm. It wasn't mm -hmm. uh, like it is today. Mm -hmm. Now, before we get into your military service, I just want to ask you some questions about uh, what life was like uh, during the Second World War for you. Well, so, go ahead. I was going to uh, junior high school then, which was mm -hmm. right ac almost across the street from where I lived which was across the street from a gas station. Mm -hmm. I went over the gas station, I got a job, mm -hmm. doing whatever, cleaning up and helping, and uh, eventually doing a little more of this and that. And uh, then at near the uh, end of the war, I think it was in 44, 45, mm -hmm. uh, if we volunteered, a friend of mine and I, we volunteered to go work on a farm for a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. And of course, we both volunteered because we got out of school like six weeks early. And where was the farm? Now, the farm I went to was in Vermont. Wow. And what was that? Where? Uh, how was it? Oh, it was fine. I loved yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Learned how to milk cows and plant potatoes and do all kinds of things. <laughs> so a kid from Roxbury learned how to milk cows. Right. Uh, let's, uh, you were just about 10 years old, or just past your 10th birthday when Pearl Harbor was attacked. Do you remember anything about that? I, I remember it. I was in, I was in the uh, kitchen with my parents, mm -hmm. <coughs> and we heard about it. And uh, they said war, and I knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were talking about it. I didn't know what to do. I was eight years old, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. So I asked them for... 10 cents or 12 cents, and I went to the movies. Mm -hmm. And did any of your relatives enter the military? Uh, no close relatives, no. Mm -hmm. And just for the record, uh, how many, were there any brothers or sisters? No, none, just none? me. Okay. And what did your father do for a living? Uh, he was mainly a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. During the war, he uh, went to work at a shipyard building uh, Landing ships, I think it was, mm -hmm. out in Hingham. Okay. And then after that, he went back to uh, being a bookkeeper in some place. And do you remember uh, when FDR died? What was that? When uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt passed away. Do you remember what happened? Uh, where yeah, I remember the day that he passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, my folks gave me, I don't know, it was 10 or 15 cents and said, they're down and wait in the corner till the papers get here and buy a paper for us. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I did. I went down and waited and bought a paper. Okay. And when the atomic bomb was dropped? I was very happy. I thought, man, that's the end of the war. No more killing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to go over there. And that was just uh, a year or two, what was it, two years before I would have been eligible to go in the Army. So oh. I figured out, no wars for me. Little did you know. So what, uh, so what happened like, after World War II and before Korea? I just went to school, had odd jobs, worked in a hardware store for a while, mm -hmm. worked in a corner grocery store for a little while. Mm -hmm. and, um, that was it, just something to keep me busy and make an extra few dollars. Okay. So it's now around the time of the Korean War. Were you drafted or did you volunteer? No, I volunteered before the war. I, mm -hmm. I went in the Army in uh, 1948, mm -hmm. a few months after I graduated high school. 
Mm -hmm. And where did you graduate high school? Uh, high School of Commerce in Boston. Okay. And why the, why the Army? Well, I went and got a job at the old Keystone Camera Factory. I didn't actually get it. There's somebody, my family knew somebody who worked there. And they got me in. I was working there for a couple of months, and I met a kid, and he said, uh, hey, what do you think about joining the Army? I said, you know, I never thought of that. It's not a bad idea. So I went home that night and told my father, I think I'm going to join the Army. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went back the next day and said, yeah, okay, I'm going to join. He said, my mother won't let me join. <laughs> So I went down and joined anyways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when I was talking to the recruiting sergeant, I guess he was at the time, at the end of filling out all the papers and asking me everything, he said to me, and where would you like to go? And I looked at him, I said, I have a choice. And he said, well, how would you like to go to Japan? I said, yeah, that sounds great, I'll go there. And did you? <laughs> yeah, I went to Japan. But before that, let's talk a little bit about basic training. Uh, basic where, training was mm -hmm. in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And was this the first time you've been away from home? Except for the little time I spent on the farm. Yeah, okay. And tell us what uh, basic was like. Very hard, physical. Mm -hmm. now, we were trained with the 82nd Airborne. And besides doing all the regular things, uh, learning to shoot and taking ath athletics and all the courses we used to take in the thing, we were always running. Everywhere we went, we ran. I couldn't stand it. Never ran so much in my life. Did you receive advanced or specialized training beyond basic? No. So you were ba uh, basically infantry? Well, I was in the infantry, mm -hmm. and we were shipping over to Japan. We had to wait in Seattle to get a ship out, mm -hmm. and the ship we were supposed to go on, which was in early December, was called away for some emergency someplace. Some ship was in trouble, so we had to wait, and being in Seattle with rain every day was not pleasant. And early <laughs> December of what year? Forty-eight. Okay, so it's still in 1948. Yeah. In very rainy Seattle. Yeah. And then what happened? Well, the first two days out on the ship was very rough and I was very seasick. After that, it was a wonderful trip. So, what part of uh, Japan did you arrive? Hmm? Where in Japan? We arrived in, I don't remember, it was Yokohama or Tokyo. Mm -hmm. But we arrived uh, Christmas Eve, day before Christmas. And instead of sending us to a large camp where all the uh, new re people came in and were assigned mm -hmm. to the units they were going to be in, they took us directly to the unit mm -hmm. we were going to be in. And what unit was that? That was the 1st Cavalry Division. I was in the 7th Cavalry Regiment. And when we got there, we were, didn't go to an exact company that we were going to go to. But they put us in barracks. Mm -hmm. And I was there a couple of days, and I got a call, a message, or whatever, uh, to go up to this room. The captain wants to see you. And I haven't been in the Army long enough. I didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I went up there, and he said, I was looking over your uh, papers, and I saw that in school you took typewriting. And I said, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell him I was a two-finger typist, <laughs> not eight. Mm -hmm. Anyways, he said, how would you like to be my company clerk? And as soon as I heard that, I knew that's a job in an office. I don't have to be out marching and training every day. Mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir, I'd love to be your company clerk. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I went over, and I became his company clerk. Mm -hmm. And I, every day, was just the same thing. I, I learned how to do with the papers, the reports, mm -hmm. and you had to be very careful. If you made one mistake in typing, you had to start over. There was no corrections allowed. And because I was sitting in the office all day and everybody saw me, I got promoted very quickly from a crew to a recruit to a private to a private first class and finally to a corporal just by working in the office. 
And how long did you work in the office? Uh, let's see, it was there on the 49th, until the uh, war started. It was about 15, 16 months. Mm -hmm. And the day we got over to Korea, somebody had a paper that all the corporals in the company were promoted to sergeants. They did that so we'd all have permanent rank. Because mm -hmm. if we waited until the day after, it would only be a temporary rank. So <laughs> now you're in Korea and you're a sergeant. Well, it was, getting to Korea was nice. It was on a nice ship. Uh -huh. But it was just like the movies. Climb over the side, go down the rope ladder, get into the ship. <laughs> you know, that's the only thing I can think of. But of course, we were going in, there was mm -hmm. nobody there to shoot at us. It was, we were in a nice, safe place. Mm -hmm. But that's the first thing I saw. But, um, Okay. And for, uh, we got on a train and we were heading north. Mm -hmm. That's where the problems were. Uh, the, first, the first night we were out sleeping in a field and we heard a shot, one shot. And the next day, a brand new lieutenant who just came to the company, we found out was killed by one of our own men. They said he must have lit a light in a cigarette or something. And they saw a light and they shot him. That was the first casualty we had. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Uh -huh. And we moved up a little more, mm -hmm. and we were on this hill. There was nothing on the hill, no trees, no shrubs, no nothing, just us. And we'd get on the top, and you can look over to your right, there was another hill, mountain. Mm -hmm. And that was all covered with trees and shrubs, and, and we were told that's where the... North Koreans were, mm -hmm. and we went on over the hill, sat in the open part of the, uh, sh uh, the, the uh, ground, and started shooting at the trees because we couldn't see anybody. And unfortunately, a very good friend of mine who was sitting about 10 yards or so to my left, and we looked at each other to say something, and he got shot and died. That was, that was snickering. Mm. And uh, so we just kept shooting for a while. Mm -hmm. And then finally my rifle jammed, so I had to run back on the other side of the hill and get that fixed. And by that time, everything quieted down. And we stayed on the hill that whole day. And that night we were evacuated and went somewhere else. I can never remember the name of the towns we were in. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you ever have any uh, direct contact with the Korean people? The South Korean people, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah we, had, we had some contact with them when we, uh, not right on the line, we had some Korean soldiers with us after mm -hmm. a while, not right away. But sometimes we were back for a little bit, and there were Korean uh, barbers around trying to make some money, take, mm -hmm. take your haircuts, and try to do whatever else they were doing there, cleaning up, wash washing the dishes and all that. Mm -hmm. But there was no big contact except one day I had to go back to Seoul for something and didn't really have a lot of contact with them, but there were a lot of people around and mm -hmm. just got to see them. Mm -hmm. um, as far as your own equipment and uniform, do you feel that you were adequately protected or adequate, adequately clothed uh, for Korea? Well, when we got there, it was summertime, yeah, we were mm -hmm. quite adequately clothed. Uh, but winter was coming, we had no winter clothes, and I guess uh, one night we were up, uh, this, by this time the Chinese were coming down, mm -hmm. and we were up some forward position, <clears throat> and we got woken up about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, it was still very dark. And we were told the Chinese are coming down the road. So we all got outside. There was about seven or eight of us with the company commander in this little hut. And we got mm -hmm. on the side of a little knoll. It wasn't high. And the co company commander said, you guys wait here. I'm going to go tell them that we're Americans. And he went out to talk to them, and he got shot. We heard two shots. That was, we knew he was killed. And then things start flying. Uh, we start shooting, and they threw some hand grenades, and I got a little piece of a hand grenade in me, mm -hmm. so I got a little wounded, and a couple of other guys said, we got to move back to the rest of the company. We were out in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. So we started to head back, and they sent one of the men 
down to another platoon. I said, get Lieutenant, I forget what his name was, and tell him to come up uh, and take care of the company. And I start walking back towards the aid station. Mm -hmm. uh, while I was going back, the, uh, the uh, colonel, I guess he was, came by in a jeep and wanted to know where I was going. I told him. I told him the lieutenant was killed. I sent for another lieutenant. And he told his driver or something. I said, he said, go get this other lieutenant, have him take over. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just went back to the aid station. And uh, it wasn't a real serious wound, but everybody who was wounded that day was being pushed further and further back. And as we got quite a ways back by the truck, we were put on the hospital ship mm -hmm. and taken away to Japan. Now, one thing happened to me, a couple things. While I was in Korea, in between all this running up and down all the hills, which mm -hmm. was all hilly, uh, quite maybe after we were there only a week or two, and we were getting pushed back by the North Koreans, we came out of the forest to a river. Mm -hmm. And we could look over to our left, and we saw the engineers getting ready to blow up a bridge. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing but water, and we knew we couldn't get there in time to get across the bridge. And then somebody was yelling from the other side of the uh, river, come on, walk across. It's not deep. We all made it. And we all got in the water and walked across. The water was up to my shoulders, and we all made it across. Mm -hmm. It was soaking wet. We never got dry clothes. They dried out in a couple of days. And we had spent that whole day and the next night and wet clothes, wet feet. And we survived, though. We, we made it. Mm -hmm. And uh, but, uh, the, yeah, that, about one of the scariest times I had. <laughs> well, let's get back uh, to the aid station and the hospital ship. Uh, were you uh, well treated? Oh, yeah, very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the hospital ship was very nice. We were mixed in with, uh, we had a couple of the uh, Australian troops with us mm -hmm. in the same room, yeah. Now, can you tell us uh, just about when this all was taking place? This was in uh, November of 50. November. That's when I got wounded. Okay. Yeah. And what happened afterward? Well. We got back over to Japan, we went to the hospital, and the doctor told me that what the hand grenade that went into me ended up in a fatty part of my body. Mm -hmm. So they were not gonna operate or take it out. So I was uh, put in to head back to Korea. And at the same time, a new hospital was opening uh, maybe 10, 15 miles outside of Korea, mm -hmm. Tokyo. That's what I forgot to tell you. When I first went to Tokyo, mm -hmm. it was stationed 10 minutes away from downtown Tokyo. It was a wonderful place to be. Oh, I can well imagine. Yeah. <laughs> it was. So we got into this new hospital, mm -hmm. and they had uh, post, uh, a notice up or something of who they needed to help finish staffing the hospital. And of course, they had company clerk on it. In Korea, you know, they didn't need company clerks. Mm -hmm. Just another rifleman then. Right. Yeah. So I went down and I got the job in the hospital as company clerk. So it saved me from going back to Korea in the winter. Mm -hmm. As I had met some of the guys, they were sending some of the people from Korea back to Japan for, uh, for a little rest for a week, 10 days. Mm -hmm. And I met some of them downtown in Tokyo one day. And they were telling me it was pretty rough over there. It was pretty cold. Mm -hmm. They were getting supplies, but they didn't have anything to start with. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So how long were you company clerk at the hospital? I was there you know, about eight, nine months, ten months. Mm -hmm. And what then I came back to the United States. Okay. Uh, what do you remember of your experiences at the hospital? Are there any stories? No, nothing really. Mm -hmm. Everybody was in the same boat. They all been through the same thing. and mm -hmm. A lot of them didn't talk about it or didn't want to. And uh, no, there was nothing special I remember. And I did go visit one of the lieutenants who got wounded the same day I did. Mm -hmm. He was in a lieutenant's ward, <laughs> away from us guys. And I went up and saw him for a few minutes. Did it look any different from the enlisted men's wards? Or? 
Hmm? Well, did the office awards look a little different? or No, yeah, he was a little different. The time he got wounded, the time he got to the hospital, he made captain. <laughs> Yeah, he was he was getting ready to go back to Korea also. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. But you got to go back to the, to the United States. Yeah, I was happy to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking uh, the army wasn't really bad. I liked it. I had a good time. I had clothes and food and mm -hmm. travel and and then uh, that's when the um, the announced on it. I said, well, I lived through one war. I don't think I'm going to stay in the Army even and get into a second one. Mm -hmm. So when my time came up, mm -hmm. uh, I, I took my discharge and got out. And when were you discharged? In, uh, let's see, it was eight months. What's eight months? September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. April, April of, of 50, 52. 52. So what happens after you come back to, to the United States? I got a job, mm -hmm. met a nice girl, got married, met a, my, a lot of my old friends. Uh, we had a little club going before I went in mm -hmm. the Army for a couple of years. And uh, I was the oldest one in. So I was the only one who really got into the war in Korea. Mm -hmm. They never got drafted. Yeah, so I met all them again, and uh, this things went on, and mm -hmm. moved to Framingham at the time, and started to raise a family. And, now, first uh, of all, uh, what job, what kind of job did you get? Uh, my first job was sitting on a little grinding wheel, mm -hmm. and the man would give us, it was a, a steel post, and had a little lid or something in the front, and we stick little diamonds into this, into this post, and stick them, and then we would grind them into phonograph needles. And how long did that job last? Oh, uh, that, I only stayed there for, uh, mm -hmm. let's see, about five months. Mm -hmm. uh, I was getting married, I wanted to get something a little better, make some more money. Mm -hmm. And I got a job at a company. At that time, they made a lot of. Uh, tablecloths and dollies and all kinds of different things out of plastic. So I went to work for them. Uh, I was in the uh, shipping room. And I stayed there for, I don't know, a year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, where did I go after that? I think I went to K Jewelers for a little while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I stayed there for maybe six, eight months. Then I went to a place called Mo Blacks in Waltham. Mm -hmm. And I was there for 14 years. And what did you do at Mo Blacks? I ran the hardware and plumbing and electrical departments. When I was younger, before school, during school and in the summers, I used to go to work with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. He was a plumber. So I got handy with a lot of little things. I didn't know at the time, but I remembered them later on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it helped me. And I, mm. and, uh, so I got these jobs. Oh, yeah, another, that's another job I had when I, before I, while I was in high school, I did work in a hardware store for mm -hmm. a couple of years. Okay. Yeah. So I stayed at Moblax for 13 years, and then uh, I wasn't really getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it was nice, met a lot of nice people. And then I went to work for a place called NASA Hardware Distributors. It's the wholesale hardware distributors in some of them. They were on their way down. The things weren't good there. Uh, business wasn't good because all these new places like True Value and Ace were coming in, mm -hmm. hurting the local hardware stores. So I stuck it out there for about a year and a half, and I finally told them, this is not going to work. We've got to sell our clothes up. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what they eventually did. We closed up. I went to work for a place called GNM Supply and Midwest Fasteners. There's two different companies, but one man owned one, and he was like the regional manager of the other one. Uh -huh. I spent 26 years there traveling on the road. I did uh, full time for 10 years, and then I went, I thought I was going to retire, but I couldn't stand it. So. <laughs> I went back to work for the same company for 16 years, 
part time. Mm -hmm. I worked uh, eight, nine, ten days a month, mm -hmm. which was plenty for me. It gave me something to do, and uh, then I got tired of it after sixteen years, and they they gave me a uh, well after the ten years they gave me a man to work with me for one year to break in, and after the sixteen years I had a man for about six, eight months to break in on the part time schedule, and I figured I'll, I'll retire again. <laughs> okay. That lasted three months. And then? <laughs> and then I am now working for the Enterprise Rent-A-Car Company, driving cars. And I have no plans on retiring again. Good for you. So tell us a little bit about Framingham in the early to mid-1950s. What was that like? Uh, what part well, of it was growing. It was mm -hmm. a very growing town. And most of the... Uh, there were so many hundreds and hundreds of new homes being put up and uh -huh. a lot of new developments. So we were in one of the new developments and everybody knew everybody. Because mm -hmm. we were all new to town, we were, right. you know, it, was, it worked fine. And uh, I lived there for uh, f for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Then I lived in another place in Framingham for six, seven. Uh, it was nice. Everything mm -hmm. was convenient. We loved it. We were near Shoppers World. We're near the supermarkets, and everything was going just fine there. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you told me you uh, lived in Framingham. You lived in... I lived in Marlboro for a while. Marlboro, yeah. Now, then I came to Nader. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, tell us a bit about your wife. My wife was, uh, had two brothers, mm -hmm. and one of them was in this group that I was belong to mm -hmm. before I went in the Army. When I, I didn't know him then, uh -huh. but when I came back, I met him, found out he had a sister. Mm -hmm. and, well, you know, well, give me a number. Let me <laughs> what was your wife's name? Huh? Your wife's name? Claire. Claire, okay. And aside from this club you mentioned, did you join any other service organizations afterward? Uh, Afterwards, when I came back, mm -hmm. uh, I went to, uh, I tried to get a, see if I was eligible for a, a disability from the mm -hmm. Army. And I sent, you know, I put it in, I was wounded, and they said, no, you weren't. And I went up to the State House with the papers. I don't know why I went there, but I went there. And I was walking out, and the American Legion, oh, I walked by the American Legion office. And somebody standing there saying, hi, how are you? What are you here for? And I told him I was trying to get my disability Mm -hmm. And they, they, they won't give it to me. He said, come on in. So I went in there and he started talking, what happened in the service? Is there any changes? And I said, well, the only change was I went in the Army with second degree flat feet. And I came out with third degree flat feet. And he said, ah, that's all we need. And he put the papers in and, <laughs> and he got me a 10% disability uh, for flat feet which meant I could go to the VA and get my art supports made. <laughs> go, to the, I go to the VA for a lot of things now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so he got that. And then I, after a while I was in Framingham, I got to meet other people. And I joined the uh, Jewish war veterans for a while. Mm -hmm. And I had only stayed with them for maybe six, eight months. They weren't really doing much of anything. Mm -hmm. So I said, nah, just forget it. I won't bother going there anymore. But uh, about three, four years ago, I rejoined them again. Okay. And I've taken an active part in them right now. and uh, I'm still collecting my disability. Mm -hmm. It's gone up like 150% since then. Mm -hmm. It's not a lot. But it's, gone but it's up. there, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, no, I haven't joined any other organizations or okay. anything. Did you, um, did you keep up with North Korea after you, um, you left the service? Oh. Did you keep up with events in North Korea or in Asia, Stay, keep up with current events? I joined, oh, that's right, what am I telling you? I did join the 1st Cavalry Division Association uh -huh. <laughs> and the 7th Cavalry Regiment Association. <laughs> I forgot all about them. And I went, for years, I went to the, uh, when I, when, before my wife died, I never went to the reunions. We were too busy, mm -hmm. and mm. had the kids growing up, and right. couldn't really afford those trips. But afterwards, I started going to all the reunions. Mm -hmm. I went to the, 
division reunion, a regiment reunion, and they were scattered all over the United States. Mm -hmm. And I did that for up until about four years ago, five years ago, and I found out almost everybody I knew there was either too sick to come or they had died. Right. And I made a few new friends, but <clears throat> they weren't the people I knew in the Army. Mm -hmm. So I, I stopped going to them. I still belong to them, but I don't go mm -hmm. to reunions anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, as far as your children, did any of them join the military? No, none of them. None? Not interested. And none of your grandchildren? <laughs> no. Yeah, my grandson did. Grandson? He, grand, he joined the Army. Mm -hmm. Let's see, he's been out of the Army four or five years. Four years. Yeah, he's been out of the Army about five years. He was in the Army for at least three, maybe four years. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons he joined he said when he came out, the Army would pay for his college education, mm -hmm. which they did. Yep. He's now a nurse. <laughs> we so happen to have someone in the Veterans Oral History Project who was, who was a nurse. He's also a lieutenant colonel. His name yeah. is uh, David Ball. Oh. Yeah. So um, back to uh, current events. I'm asking this because of the recent death of the president of North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, any thoughts on that? No. Mm -hmm. No, I really have not really kept up with most of the things in the world, mm -hmm. world news. Okay. I read about them. Uh, mm -hmm. What's it doing for me? Is it affecting me? No, mm -hmm. man. What about when um, the movie and the TV series MASH came out? You know, I never watched it. You never did? Oh, I won't say never. I probably saw two or three episodes. Uh -huh. uh, I wasn't more interested mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, before we wrap up this interview, is there any other thoughts you'd like to uh, give to those who are going to be seeing this in the future? No. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of, you know, I'm sitting here thinking of things. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of things that happened in Korea. They had about 12 American prisoners, the North, mm -hmm. I think it was the South Koreans, maybe, maybe, yeah, it was North Koreans at the time, pretty sure. And they had them on a hill, and they were, they were their prisoners, and they wanted to take them down and bring them to the rear with other prisoners they have. And every time they moved, they were pushed back by American fire. So they shot every one of them in the head and left them there for dead, and they took off. Mm -hmm. I always remember that. They couldn't get them out, so they killed them. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And is there anything else? Mm. Not that I can think of right now. Okay. Well, Charles Levitt, we thank you for coming and taking part in the uh, Veterans Oral History Project. Hey, my pleasure. Glad to do it. Mm -hmm.